Good morning from Stanford University. It's great to welcome you back um, to the Storage Egg Symposium. And for those joining us new, welcome. My name is Will Chu. I'm the faculty co-director of the initiative here. Today is a, a, a great day because it is the two-year anniversary of our seminar series. Um, so as most of you know, we started the seminar series uh, two years ago uh, at the uh, beginning of COVID, uh, and we launched um, with a, a really awesome talk by our Nobel laureate, Stan Wintingham. And uh, it has been a tremendous honor to host the seminar uh, for the past two years. And what a great way to celebrate this occasion by inviting two of my great colleagues from Slack National Accelerator Laboratory to talk about uh, advanced characterization of materials for energy storage. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, let me first introduce a little bit um, about Slack. Uh, Slack is a Department of Energy National Laboratory right next to Stanford University that is operated by Stanford. And it is also the home to several unique scientific facilities, such as a X-ray synchrotron and a free electron laser. And for the past decade, um, two of our uh, scientists, uh, Johanna Wecker and Yijing Liu, have been developing advanced methodologies for characterizing materials for batteries and other systems while they operate, while they age. And today, we're really thrilled to have both of them talk to us about the techniques they have developed, uh, as well as the insights they have derived uh, from these very advanced measurements. Uh, this is something that's very uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, the ability to see what is happening has really transformed uh, many fields, for example, medicine, and it is now will on its way to also transform uh, energy storage as well, uh, most specifically batteries, but also extending to other forms of energy storage. So it is really my great pleasure um, to introduce uh, Johanna first. Um, so Johanna is currently the lead scientist um, at Slack National Accelerator Laboratory, and she's responsible for uh, one of the several um, X-ray beam lines at uh, the Stanford Synchrotron. And she has been doing pioneering work on a wide range of materials for energy storage, um, from lithium sulfur to graphite to lithium metal, and really combining a wide range of techniques to understand uh, what is happening as the materials operate. Um, she is uh, one of the pioneering folks in this area, really uh, developing the methodologies and then also applying them to real battery systems. I, I still remember one of the first images of uh, lithium sulfur batteries undergoing cycling about 10 years ago, which is really blown away um, on what you can see. And then uh, there's been tremendous progress since then. So let me invite Johanna to come to the stage and then she will be sharing um, all the latest and greatest uh, from her work here at Slack. Johanna. Um, yes, thank you um, for the invitation to speak um, at Storage X, and um, uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, so today, this morning, I'm going to talk about um, the X-ray characterization that we can do um, to observe battery degradation. Um, as Will said, my name is Johanna Nelson Wacker, um, and if you want to learn more about the research that my group is doing, um, this is my website. You can feel free to re reach out to me um, by email with any questions you have afterwards. Um, so one of the great things about X-ray characterization, um, which we've been utilizing over the last few years, is um, the fact that we can characterize across the relevant battery length scales using x-rays. Um, so we've done a lot of research um, spanning full cells, um, going to half cells, looking at the particle level um, at individual electrodes, and also looking at the atomic level. And we also, simultaneous to, to spanning all of these length scales that are relevant, we also want to observe the batteries in real, as realistic conditions as possible, depending on the technique that we're using. Um, one of the additional benefits of using x-rays to characterize batteries is that we can also um, characterize um, different chemistries by tuning our x-ray energy to different um, wavelengths. So um, if we want to look at um, the low Z materials like carbon and oxygen and fluorine, which are really important, um, for example, in the batteries, um, uh, 
in the um, SEI in the um, solid electrolyte interface. Um, we can uh, go to soft X-rays, which are um, low energy, um, long wavelengths. Um, if we want to look, for example, at sulfur batteries, um, we can go to the what we call tender X-rays, which is a little harder of an X-ray, a little um, higher X-ray energy. And then finally, if we want to look at, for example, the transition metals in the in the cathode, um, we can go to even um, harder X-rays or um, higher X-ray energy. And so by changing our X-ray energy, we can change the chemistries that we're sensitive to. And so the fact that we can um, change what we're sensitive to and X-rays can penetrate a lot of um, materials that electrons or um, visible light cannot penetrate. And we have a number of different techniques that span the length scales that are relevant. Um, we have a really powerful tool at a synchrotron to study batteries. And so in a, um, for the next half hour, I'm gonna give you two examples um, of just um, two different types of tools that we've used on two different battery types. Um, so the first example I'm going to talk about is the transmission X-ray microscopy or TXM. Um, and that will allow us to see morphology changes. Um, and I'm gonna specifically target um, porous alloying anodes. So how can we make an anode that's, that's better than our current anodes um, but doesn't have this degradation problem of, of silicon and other alloying anodes where they crack and break apart after the first few cycles. The second example I'm going to give is to um, use X-ray diffraction. And X-ray diffraction is a, a common technique that is used across the field. Uh, many people can do this um, in their um, home laboratories, but we're going to do this um, by um, narrowing down our X-ray beam and using diffraction as a way of mapping a full cell and to get the microstructure um, across a pouch cell. And so we're going to be looking at specifically the degradation um, that we, has been caused by fast charging. <clears throat> so for the first example, um, alloying anodes, um, as we all likely know, um, alloying anodes such as silicon, um, tin, um, are much higher capacity, gravimetric capacity, um, than our current anodes, which are made out of carbon. Um, they don't quite get up to lithium metal, um, but they do solve a lot of problems that lithium metal still have. Um, and so with this large capacity, though, comes this large volume change. Um, so we can get to 300, 400% volume change as we're inserting lithium ions and alloying um, with the metal. And this large volume change, especially repeated over thousands of cycles, um, causes cracking and fracturing. It also has um, um, continuously breaking of the solid electrolyte interface. So we need to create an interface that's um, flexible enough um, to either go with this volume change or we need to mitigate the volume change. And so this is severely limited, for example, silicon batteries. And so um, my collaborators and I um, from UCLA, um, they developed um, a way of doing nanoporosity um, very simply by um, selective de-alloying. And so you have a parent alloy and you selectively um, dissolve one of the metals and you come with a result in a porous structure. And so um, they've done this for tin in this example, and they have a, an internal porosity of about 25% and pores that are on 30 to 175 nanometers. And what they found when they cycled over hundreds of cycles is their nanoporous tin was very stable <clears throat> over hundreds of cycles, whereas if they cycled dense tin particles, um, there was no stability at all and it couldn't even cycle um, more than 10 cycles um, reliably. And so um, we took this nanoporous tin and stuck it in our transmission x-ray microscope um, and we found that we could see the pores and we decided that um, this porous network was visible um, in 2D. And so we wanted to study it, um, not just um, after cycling it, but while we're cycling it. And so we took transmission X-ray microscope images um, during the first lithiation and delithiation cycle of dense tin, which is on this top row, and compared it to this nanoporous tin. And I give you just two examples of, of um, one particle um, per cell, um, but we actually looked at multiple cells um, and multiple locations across the cells. Um, because this technique is very fast compared to the cycling um, 
times, we can actually look at um, more than 10 areas at one time. And so what we found, if we traced out the um, area, and we can only say something about the aerial expansion rather than the volume expansion, because these are 2D images, um, and we can track that in time with um, voltage, we see this large burst expansion in the area um, in the dense tin at the very end of the lithiation cycle. And you can see that here. Um, so we have this dense tin that hardly changes in volume at all until the very end. And at this very low voltage, we get this large expansion and a crack. Um, the nanoporous tin, on the other hand, didn't show much of a total aerial expansion if you track it over time or over a voltage. Um, but we did see this morphology change, which was kind of disappointing. And so during the delithiation cycle, um, looking at that, those same two particles, we see that as we deinsert lithium, um, we don't return to the original volume or shape um, of uh, the dense tin. And you can see this in the aerial expansion plot. Um, and we do return um, with the nanoporous tin, but again, we have this morphology change. And so what we found is dense tin is um, irreversibly deformed. It does not return to its original area. Um, porous tin, on the other hand, returns to its same size, but it's not in the same shape. So there's this irreversible morphology change that we want to get rid of. And so we took it in one step further. And so we hypothesized that if we have an intermetallic with both metallics, both uh, metallics being active alloys to lithium that lithiate at different potentials, then they can act as the stabilizing agent in the structure while the other alloy is alloying. And so we have this uh, tin antimony alloy. And while we're, for example, lithiating tin, the antimony uh, stabilizes the structure and vice versa when we're lithiating the antimony. And again, we can take this tin antimony parent alloy and de-alloy the tin so that we have an equal mix of tin and antimony in a porous network. And so now we have this porous structure. Um, it's got a little smaller of pores, about 20 to 50 nanometer pores. Um, and it is a tin antimony alloy, as we can see from the diffraction, and it cycles very well. And so we took this and we wanted to see how um, this cycled under um, the TXM. And so here are just one example again of a porous tin antimony alloy. Um, during lithiation, we see that the particle does grow. There's actually cracks that form. Here's a crack that interestingly forms and then actually disappears as the particle continues to grow, um, but other cracks form as well. So there's a few cracks that are forming, um, but there's a lot less morphology change than we saw in just the porous tin. And then during delithiation, the particle shrinks again, um, but the cracks remain. So if we just compare um, a few snapshots, this is nanoporous tin, another example that I showed before, but it shows the same uh, large morphology change, even if we don't have an aerial expansion change. Um, and then that nanopores tin antimony on the bottom, which shows an aerial expansion um, returning to its original area um, and no morphology change other than a few cracks. Um, we can also plot this. The nanopores tin antimony is this brown and it follows very closely the aerial expansion of the nanopores tin. And so they both um, have an increase in area and then uh, during delithiation returned to nearly their same original area, where if you see again, this is just the bulk tin um, plotted again, we can see that the bulk tin is, is obviously not returning to its original state. So we have a similar aerial expansion in this tin antimony alloy, that's nanoporous, um, but it's a much more stable particle morphology. And so we wanted to look a little closer um, on what exactly was happening with the nanopores that made it a more stable morphology. And so um, if we just looked at a small section um, at the side of the particles, um, the particle is then thin enough that we can actually see the porous structure. 
if we look at the center of the particle, because we only have 2D images at the moment, um, it's really hard to see the porous structure because it's um, so thick of a particle. But if we look at the sides, we can see this nanoporous structure. This is the nanoporous tin on top. Below, you can see the smaller pores of the nanoporous tin antimony. And this is um, before cycling, after lithiation, and then after delithiation. And you can see the pores in the lithiated nanoporous tin have expanded. The pore walls actually break. Um, and so it's this, this nanostructure in the nanoporous tin, the, the, the nanopores that are breaking apart that's causing the large morphology to change. And so if you plot the average pore area over in lots of different, lots of pores in this um, region, you can see that um, as you lithiate the nanoporous tin, the pores wall pore walls break, so you get a larger pore area, the pores are expanding, and then they become unstable as um, the pores uh, collapse, and um, during delithiation, there's just further damage, and you do not return to this nanopore structure. The nanopore tin antimony, on the other hand, is more stable um, at the nanometer level. And so the pore walls expand and actually get filled. And so we have a contraction of the pore area. Um, and you can see this in this image. The pore wall pores actually get smaller as the nanoporous tin antimony expands into the pores. And then they contract and you see that you retain that nanopore structure after that first cycle. So we have a very stable nanopore structure with this tin antimony alloy. We wanted to see how stable that was. And so um, because of the way that synchrotron radiation works and how you get beam time on um, a synchrotron instrument, um, it's not possible to, to take the same cell and look at it over hundreds of cycles. Um, and so we took a different cell and um, at UCLA, we cycled it for 35 cycles. Um, and you can see it's stabilizing. Um, and we wanted to look at, okay, what's the 36th cycle look like? Does it look, behave the same as it did in the first cycle? And so this is our nanoporous tin antimony alloy during the 36th lithiation cycle and then delithiation cycle. So it's a different particle than we saw before. It's a different cell than we saw before. Um, but you can see that, again, we have a very stable morphology. There's very little change happening during delithiation. I mean, lithiation and delithiation, even after uh, 35 cycles. And if we plot the aerial expansion um, in the open circles of the 36th cycle, you can see, again, we have this increase in volume or area and then a decrease. But it doesn't increase as much as we did in the first cycle, which is not surprising because every cycle, it has this slow, um, small amount of not recovering to its original um, area. So there's less expansion than the first cycle, but we still have a very stable um, mor uh, morphology on the macro scale. Um, if we look at the pores, we also have very stable pore structures still. And so um, this again is just looking at um, the open circuit voltage before the 36th cycle. You can see the pore structure is still visible. This is fully lithiated as the pores have um, expanded. I mean, collapsed because the um, tin antimony is expanding into the pores, and then they reappear as you delithiate. And so if you plot, again, the 36, um, the average pore area with voltage versus the first um, cycle, you can see the behavior is very similar. There's a similar decrease in pore size and then recovery. And so we found a very stable nanoporous alloy um, using tin antimony. So in, an, in a side project that we had, or parallel project in the same um, program, which was um, an energy frontier research center called Scalar, um, we were exploring an alternate strategy, and that was to do interfacial engineering. And so here, we again have this tin antimony alloy structure, but we've engineered an interface that is um, bismuth rich and it's liquid like. So it allows some slippage between the tin antimony um, grains. And so you can see this in cryo stem, you can see this um, bismuth rich 
grain boundary. Um, and we found that using X-ray tomography, using again our um, transmission X-ray microscope, um, we can look in 3D this time, but it's ex situ. So we just harvested these particles. Um, we can look at um, the structure with the bismuth um, interfacial engineering scheme, and then without it, just with the, the tin antimony alloy. And if we take 2D slices from these 3D volumes, you can see there's a few cracks in the bismuth example, um, but there's significantly more cracks um, without this um, enriched grain boundary. And so um, after 20 cycles, these are after 20 cycles, um, we get fewer cracks um, with this interfacial engineering. And so our next step, step in this project is can we combine the strategies? Can we get tin antimony alloy um, with nano porosity and this interfacial engineering where we have these liquid like grain boundaries um, that allow slippage between um, the tin antimony grains. And so that's what we're working on um, next in this project. Um, so for the remaining part of this talk, I want to um, switch directions and talk about diffraction and use diffraction to map out the microstructure um, of cells after fast charging and look at what the degradation mechanism of fast charging is in these cells. So fast charging, I'm gonna define that um, as any charging that's faster than 15 minutes. Um, that's about equivalent of about a 4C charge. Um, and so the benefit of fast, char or the, the, the need for fast charging is, um, I actually heard this, um, recently at, um, um, at a talk is, is, you know, people when they buy or they're, with, they're thinking about buying an electric vehicle, um, they care about range. But once you own an electric vehicle, you care about fast charging. Um, so you really want to be able to go to a charging station and in a pinch, charge your battery to 80% um, in a matter of a few minutes. Um, but how do we design batteries that work well for fast charging that don't compromise um, the normal charging rates? And so um, it's believed that lithium plating can dominate the degradation mechanisms um, in fast charging and reduce the capacity. And this is done through a loss of lithium inventory. And so we wanted to um, use our x-ray techniques to quantify the amount of lithium plating and really make that connection to the capacity loss. So normally, if you're um, testing um, cells and you want to see if you've plated lithium, the typical thing to do is to disassemble your cell and look at it visibly. So if you just take an image um, with your cell phone camera um, of disassembled anodes, you can see in, uh, for example, a 10 minute charging, you have lots of, lots of lithium plating um, on your graphite. Whereas in a 15 minute charging, there's only a little bit of lithium plating that's visible. But that's not a very scientific quantitative measure of the amount of lithium. That's basically looking at how shiny um, is our um, anode. And so we wanted it to be a little more quantitative. And so we turned to X-ray diffraction. And we thought to do X-ray diffraction because lithium metals um, crystalline. And X-ray diffraction is sensitive to any crystalline material, um, even low Z materials um, that are transparent to X-rays, like lithium metal. And so we take a small X-ray beam and pass it through our pouch cell that we haven't disassembled um, and look at different spots. And we have some spots um, looking at the diffraction pattern in 2D, which are then rings. Um, if we integrate that over Q, you can get some small some spots that have strong peaks um, at the lithium um, Q, and that indicates a lot of lithium, some medium peaks, and then some very weak or no peaks at all. And so we can map this um, and uh, pseudo color it as a heat map um, to give us a spatial map of any of the crystalline species over the pouch cell. So here is a typical diffraction pattern of the pouch cells we used. Um, these were graphite anodes and um, 832 um, NMC, so sorry, NMC of 532 cathodes. And so um, we can see the NMC peaks, um, they're labeled in green. Um, they're very strong, and we can see the graphite peaks. As graphite lithiates, um, staged graphite peaks appear, and these graphite peaks disappear. 
And as we um, plate lithium, we should be able to see a lithium peak, although it is very small compared to these large um, peaks that dominate the diffraction pattern. Um, and the real benefit of this is it's going to be significantly more quantitative than just visually inspecting whether or not you've plated lithium. And we can do this without disassembling the cell. And so we took seven different cells. Here is the fast charging capacity loss of these seven cells. Um, there were two cells that were cycled at 4C, three cells cycled at 6C, um, and here is sort of the details of, of exactly their charging protocols. All of them were discharged um, at a slow rate at C over two. Um, and then we have two cells that were cycled at um, 9C. And you can see there's a range of um, capacity loss across these cells um, after 450 cycles. And it's, it's spread out even um, looking at just the 9C cells, um, you get a, a small capacity loss in one of them and a significantly larger capacity loss in the other one. So there's, there's a large spread in how these um, identical batteries behave even over similar or identical um, cycling um, uh, protocols. And so we took all of these seven cells um, and I've put them in boxes for their different charging. Um, so looking at the 4C, we uh, mapped them with X-ray diffraction. This is a heat map of lithium. Um, and then after we, we fully mapped them, then we disassembled them just to prove our point that we could in fact map lithium. And so here in the 4C, you can see there's two bright spots of lithium and they correlate very well um, with the, um, what you can visibly see on the electrode. Um, if you plat, plot, if you plate more lithium, um, these are the 10 minute charging, um, you get more inflated lithium, but again, it correlates, our heat maps correlate um, with what we visibly see. Um, and we also have the 9C charging. And here you can see these are the two um, 9C cells that charged or had very large capacity fade differences. So we have one that's 10C capacity. It doesn't seem to actually have a lot of lithium plated um, and one with almost 30% capacity fade, which has a lot of lithium. So just anecdotally, just looking at these cells right now, it seems to match that the more XFC capacity loss you have, the more lithium plating um, you can see. So in the next slide, I'm just gonna focus down on these two 9C cells. And so here again are those heat maps of lithium metal um, and where it is on the anode. We can also, because graphite is crystalline, we can, we can um, map um, with the same data um, what the graphite um, heat map looks like. And you can see where there's less graphite, there's more lithium. And that's a little confusing because you're like, well, where's the graphite going? Well, it's not going anywhere. It's actually no longer graphite because it's staged graphite. It's, L it's LIC6. So if we map the LIC6 peaks, we can see they correlate with the lithium. And so these two nominally identical cells look very different, both where the lithium is um, plated as metal, but also where the lithium is trapped in the graphite. And these are both mapped at 0% state of charge. So 100% of the lithium should be in the cathode. And so what we see, first of all, there's more lithium with more capacity fade, um, significantly more lithium with more capacity fade, even in these nomin nominally identical cells. And also the lithium that's plated is co-located with lithium that's trapped in the graphite. And so something's going on that's either causing the lithium to plate where there's degradation in the graphite, or it's the lithium in the graphite not able to escape as you delithiate um, the anode um, because the lithium metal is plated and blocking. Um, and so this is all just a reminder, this is all what I call dead lithium because we're at a 0% state of charge. So we are unable to delithiate um, and strip this lithium metal out. So if we again look at all of those seven cells um, and we sum all of the total lithium plated, so taking each of those spots in the heat map and sum up the total amount of lithium, um, we can plot the loss of lithium inventory 
from the known amount of lithium um, that we start with before um, fast charging um, and the um, subtracted from the amount that we see plated with capacity loss. And then the loss of lithium inventory that is due to it being the lithium being trapped in the graphite as LIC6 versus capacity loss. And you can see for um, the amount of lithium that's trapped in the graphite, that is not dependent on the percent of the capacity loss. Um, so that is independent of um, capacity. And so we think that um, is dominated at least um, by the capacity that, uh, sorry, that the amount of lithium that's trapped just from the formation cycles before we did fast charging. Um, and um, on the other hand, the loss of lithium inventory from plated lithium um, is linear with capacity loss. And so the, the uh, loss of lithium inventory does scale linearly with the fast charging capacity loss. And so that goes hints towards loss of lithium inventory is plated lithium is dead lithium is the driving um, mechanism for capacity fade in fast charging batteries. <clears throat> because we have not disassembled the cell, before we took these heat maps with diffraction, we also are sensitive to the crystalline um, cathode material. So we can track the state of charge, we can map the state of charge um, in the cathode as well. And so going back to those two 9C cells, um, this again is the lithium heat map, um, looking at the plated lithium. Um, we can look at, <clears throat> looking at the unit cell volume of the NMC crystalline structure. Um, so as it expands and contracts, um, as you lithiate and delithiate it, um, that can be mapped to state of charge. And we also plotted the um, peak width because we noticed that the peak width of the NMC um, 003 peak um, changes. And so two things that we found, <clears throat> um, the changes in the NMC peak width correlate very well with lithium plating. And so this is that second plot here. You can see it plots, uh, it correlates very well with where we've plated lithium. We also found that the lower unit cell volume, that means there's less, less lithium in the NMC, likely more lithium um, where it shouldn't be on the anode side, correlates to more dead lithium. And so here, the darker regions here correlate um, with the lithium intensity um, of the plated lithium. And so they're a little more spread out than you have, um, but there is definitely talk between, there's interaction between um, the lithium that's being plated on the anode and what's happening on the cathode as a result of it. And so finally, we decided to plot the occupancy of the cathode. And so going to, um, the, the cathode side, we can plot, just like we did the, the amount of lithium at, on the anode, we can plot the lithium in the cathode. And we found that the lithium occupancy in the cathode is also linear with the capacity that's retained in the cell. And so therefore, all of the lithium in the cathode is active. And that's because capacity fade is the loss of lithium inventory plus the loss of active cathode material and active anode material. And if we can explain all of the capacity fade from the loss of lithium inventory, um, then we can say that um, the lithium in the cathode is active lithium um, and the loss of lithium inventory can be completely accounted for by the capacity fade during can completely account for the capacity fade during fast charging. So this is just another sort of nail in the coffin um, confirming that um, for fast charging, the loss of lithium inventory due to dead lithium from lithium plating and not being able to strip again is really the driving factor um, in the capacity fade during fast charging. So to summarize, um, I give you just two examples of the types of, of x-ray tools that we have at the synchrotron. We use um, the transmission x-ray microscope to look at morphology changes. We found that um, there was stability in being both nanoporous and also having this dual alloy of tin antimony. 
And we also um, started to explore interfacial engineering with this bismuth um, um, layer in between grain boundaries. And now we're trying to combine those two techniques to get even more stable um, alloying anode materials. Um, and then we use diffraction to map out the microstructure. And we can find um, that the loss of lithium inventory um, through lithium plating is the dominant reason for capacity fade during fast charging. And we can look without taking apart the cell at all, we can look at where the lithium is in both the anode and also in the cathode. So finally, I want to thank my research group. They're the ones who really did all of the um, hard work. Um, the anode work was started by Jesse Koh, who's now at Johns Hopkins. Um, it's been taken up by um, David Ajaman Budu, who's currently in my group. And um, the lithium mapping with diffraction was um, done by Partha Paul, who's now at the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility. I also want to thank my collaborators um, and thank the funding sources, um, the tin antimony alloy work. Um, was done by um, an energy frontier research center called Scalar. And um, the other work was done um, by Ex the Excel program, which was a collaboration between Slack, Argon, Idaho National Lab. And then finally, I just wanted to spend um, two seconds to plug a um, virtual field trip that we're doing between um, Berkeley and, and Slack. Um, please visit our website to um, register for the next workshop, uh, next field trip. Um, you can also see past shows there. Um, our next virtual field trip is going to be a zero carbon housing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joanna. The field trip looks very exciting. Um, well, thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, wow, two really challenging problems um, from the material side um, of an alloying, alloying electrode and, and overcharging. So we have a number of questions, um, but I thought I will start with, um, with a, an overarching one. So you mentioned um, in the second part of the talk, um, a, a lot of analysis based on what, tracking where the lithium goes in terms of between anode cathode and, and lost lithium. What have you learned from the images um, about where um, the lithium plating occurs? So, so we learned similar to what people have observed in the past, um, that the lithium plates near the edges, but not at the edges of um, the anode. Um, and they actually plate um, further from the edge than, for example, the overlap between the anode and the cathode. There's a mismatch between the anode and the cathode. Um, so um, it's a little further in than that. Um, but it is, Knowing where the lithium is going to plate first um, is still unknown, I would say. That um, seemed to be very um, random between the cells. If you just have a little bit of lithium, where is it going to be um, going first? And so some follow-up um, work that's happening um, now is really to track um, in the first few cycles, rather than looking at you know, already dead batteries, where is that lithium plating first? And how, how is the cathode the, the state of the cathode and the health of the cathode related to that or not related at all. Right, John. So just to clarify, so you're seeing these sort of large scale features, like you said, a bit away from the edge, but not quite at the edge. Were there also unexpected, like a hot spot? You know, all you need is really one um, plate of lithium to short the cell. Um, were there any sort of um, randomly occurring spots um, in the cell in your study? Not in our study that we discovered. And I think that goes to the fact that we were looking at cells um, that had been cycled for 450 cycles. So they were very well cycled. And so there was um, at least <clears throat> in the 6C and the 9C cells, um, there was a lot of lithium plating. And so um, we didn't see, we didn't look at any cells that had actually been shorted by um, lithium dendrites, for example. They all survived to 450 cycles, even though they had severe capacity loss. Um, so we weren't looking at that sort of very detrimental, um, but rare event of lithium um, shorting the battery. Um, so here's another related question to that. So I think most of the images you showed are all planner images. Um, 
have you done any, this is a question from one of our audience, uh, have you looked at any cross sections about, you know, is it happening closer to the separator, closer to the current collector? Um, for the lithium plating work? Right. Yeah. Um, no, we haven't yet. Um, and I think that um, is a tricky thing to do in the cells that we, that we had. Um, we have looked at, at cross-sectional cells, um, but they're usually um, sort of designed cells that aren't your standard cells. Mm -hmm. um, we do have some related work trying to um, use both neutron and X-ray imaging um, in coin cells, um, and that will and, and and with tomography. And so we will be able to see um, in all three dimensions where the lithium is plating. Um, and so that work is is pending. <laughs> Wow, that is really exciting. So the, the goal is to have a 3D resolved um, plated lithium. Yeah, yeah. And the reason we, yeah, yeah. And the reason we'd use um, neutron imaging in addition to X-ray imaging is they're both sensitive to very different things. And so neutrons are very sensitive to lithium metal. Awesome. Well, we have time for one final question. So you also showed this really nice results of the alloying electrode. Uh, and I know that you've also worked on conversion electrode. Do, do you generally find that X-ray imaging has sufficient resolution to reveal these, what we think to be very nanoscale effects um, uh, in these um, very high volume changing electrodes? Yeah, it's, it's always a struggle. So as a microscopist, um, you have this uh, sort of tug, pull and tug between um, wanting to get the highest resolution image possible and wanting to see a statistically relevant amount of the battery. And so I can either, um, with this transmission X-ray microscope, I can get 30 nanometer resolution on a single particle. Um, I can do this in 3D and get maybe 50 nanometer resolution, um, but I'm spending a lot of time on one particle. I could also go to the micro CT and get a larger field of view 3D image but with um, only maybe a micron or half a micron resolution. Um, so it's always a question of, do you what do you want to see? So what's the question you're asking? And then picking the right tool for that question. If I want to go to even higher resolution, then I would always go to an electron microscope. But of course, then you have to um, design your sample so that it fits within the electron microscope. So you can, you can look at a lot of particles, and get a relevant um, sort of survey of many what many particles are doing, or you can go to high resolution and figure out what's what's happening on the nano scale um, on a single particle. And so I would say we need to do everything. Sounds uh, like a big opportunity. Um, there are a lot of uh, additional questions in the chat, so I think Johanna, if you have a few moments, uh, feel free to answer them uh, via the chat. And thank you so much for sharing that. We'll have you back for a discussion after Yi Jing's talk. So uh, following Johanna's excellent introduction of X-ray uh, imaging and diffraction, uh, Yi Jing Liu, uh, who is uh, also a lead scientist at Slack National Accelerator Laboratory and at the Stanford Synchrotron, will uh, continue this theme and um, talk about 3D uh, imaging uh, from very small scales to very large scales. And I also, have the pleasure of knowing Yijing for about 10 years. I still remember um, the, one of the early talks he gave. I forgot exactly what material was, but it was on 3D tomography um, of some very complex system. And I thought, wow, this is uh, so much you can learn just by, um, uh, by visualizing things with such ex exquisite detail. Uh, something I want to say about Yijing is that not only is he developing the measurement methods, but he's also developing and pioneering the interpretation methods. Uh, these data sets that you obtain, it's, it's very, very large terabytes in size. And he's one of the pioneers in applying advanced uh, methods such as machine learning and, and, vis um, uh, and computer vision to really understand and interpret these giant data sets. Uh, and Jing has been um, um, and leading the fields of uh, um, understanding cathode materials and developing cathode microstructure which is highly relevant to lithium ion batteries. Uh, so Yijing, we're greatly looking forward to your uh, many of the beautiful images and movie you will show uh, in the next 30 minutes. Uh, Yijing, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you, Will, for the uh, very kind introduction and thank you for the op 
opportunity to present my work. As you can see from this title, I will highlight the uh, multi-scale aspect of the research for lithium-ion batteries. Now, before I talk about uh, batteries, talk about the technology we developed uh, over the years, I want to show you one old photo taken about, um, about 10 years ago. So you can see that this photo was taken in the year 2013, and you can see Johanna and myself together with our colleagues, Joy and Darius at the Bing line at SSRL. You have met Johanna just now. She has not changed at all over the years. On the other hand, you see me right now, I uh, age a lot. So together, we not only study batteries, but also provide useful data to you know, review the degradation or the aging mechanism for the battery scientists as well. Now, a little bit introduction of my research group. I um, work in a very highly interdisciplinary area. We play with the materials, we do the characterization, we uh, make sense of the data, and then we do all of this for the uh, desired functionality. Well, the cartoon is simple, but when you look at the real, um, real sample or real data we are interfacing with, you realize that there are a lot of problems here and there. The materials can be very messy. The device is full of defects. The experiment we do is highly delicate. Many things can go wrong. And the data we acquired in there is very noisy. And that's why we really need to tackle this problem in a very systematic fashion in which we need to develop not just the uh, experimental methods, but also the computational uh, tools to help us to uh, harvest information from the data. Now let's talk about lithium ion batteries. Uh, I'm sure that the people in the audience are very familiar with this. The lithium ion battery has two electrodes and the lithium ion goes in back and forth as the uh, um, um, uh, cell is operated. Now, if you look at the real thing, the real physical device, you realize that it's highly complicated through many different scales. As I said, you know, if you zoom in to look at the internal structure of a cylindrical cell, you see this jerry roll structure. If you further zoom in, you look at the electrodes, they are made of thousands and millions of uh, uh, particles. And these particles, they agglomerate together in different fashion. They have different size, they have different shape. They have complicated internal structures. And if you look into the um, subparticle structure, you see the uh, domains, grains, and of course, if you further zoom in, look at the atomic scale, there are local um, phase transformations and local uh, uh, lattice distortions as well. Now, because I didn't study batteries, didn't study electrochemistry in, in my grad school, that's why when I look at the complicated systems, I need to develop my own understanding of it. And this is what I did. If we think about what happens when you charge a lithium ion battery, let's look at the bottom row here first. What happened in the charging process is that the lithium ion and the electron will diffuse from the bulk of the cathode to the surface of the cathode. And after that, the electron and the lithium ion, they will go through different pathways. And hopefully they will meet on the other side, on the surface of the anode. And then they um, get together, they then uh, integrate into the uh, anode structure. Now that reminds me of the uh, traveling experience, which everybody is familiar with, right? What you have to do is you have to diffuse through the traffic, you get to the airport. You are so close to the airplane already, you might even see the airplane through the window, but there's a little bit of inconvenience standing, uh, standing in the way. After that, the passengers and the uh, check luggage, they go through different pathways. Now, hopefully you will meet on the other side, and then you can go through another diffusion to the destination, which is the hotel. Now, the problem here is that these two, um, uh, two charge carriers, they have uh, different resistance. Lithium ion is slow, electron is fast. It's similar to this uh, traveling uh, scenario where the passengers usually arrive and has no problem, but the luggage can be missing. So that's why you, you could potentially get stuck because of that. Now for this complicated system, we care about the uh, uh, morphology, we care about the lattice structure, we care about the oxidation state. And utilizing the S-ray based technology can uh, help us to understand many of these different aspects of the material at these different land scales and can offer very valuable information 
for us to gain uh, in-depth understanding of the system. Now let's uh, show, let me show you a few examples. We can start with uh, a very small scale, looking at the uh, um, lattice distortion within a single primary grass. Now in this particular case, what we do is we utilize a nano-focus X-ray beam and illuminate a uh, lithium copper oxide single, uh, single grain. Now, when we talk about a single primary grain, we usually think it's a single crystal, but is it really a single crystal? The answer is not, right? And what we do, do is that when we have the um, nanofocus as we're being uh, illuminated on a sample, it will generate a bread diffraction in a certain angle. Now, if the sample is really a single crystal, then when you conduct the raster scan of the beam over the particle, the bread peak should not change at all. You know, long range structure ordering, that's the definition of single crystals. But in reality, what we observe is that as we conduct the raster scanning, this uh, bread peak will deform, it will move. So that carries information about the lattice distortion within this single primary grain. And by doing this uh, mapping, we can then reveal how this uh, um, uh, lattice is deformed. There's a uh, despacing, inhomogeneity, there's twisting of the lattice, and also the bending. Uh, depending on how the bread peak is deformed. Now that's what happened inside a single crystal. It's already very complicated. What happened uh, beyond the, the, the single primary grain? What happened across the grain boundary? So we show here that the, um, a uh, 3D imaging of one single uh, particle that has two uh, grains attached to each other. As we can see from the morphological data on the top here, you know, uh, this uh, grain boundary actually has uh, mechanical consequences. If there's a crack uh, that's formed, it's gonna likely propagate along this grain boundary, causing these two grains to detach from each other. And in addition to the mechanical, um, uh, mechanical degradation, this, the existence of this uh, grain boundary also has chemical consequences. Right. If you look at these uh, images on the bottom, uh, which is conducted using a spectral microscopy that is sensitive to the oxidation state of the um, element of interest, cobalt in this case, you can see that these two domains, they exhibit different uh, oxidation state, in, uh, in, exhibit different cobalt oxidation state, which fingerprints the uh, state of charge, local state of charge. So the existence of the grain boundary actually hinders the free uh, lithium um, uh, migration across the grain boundary. That's why these two domains shows different state of charge. And apparently this uh, state of uh, charge heterogeneity at this level is not good for the battery um, performance. So what we do then, what do we do? We would like to modify the uh, um, property of this interface. We want to um, address this problem by conduct this uh, engineering of a buried interface. And the approach we uh, adopted is this uh, trace element doping method. So what we do is, is uh, we conduct a uh, um, uh, very low concentration, about 0.1 weight percent, co-doping of titanium, magnesium, alumina for this material. Now it's interesting to show here that through the experimental result, the different dopant actually has different spatial distribution inside this particle. For example, the aluminum is more or less everywhere. On the other hand, you can see from this image that the uh, uh, titanium naturally segregates onto the grain boundary. So it naturally modifies the property at the uh, grain boundary at the interfaces, which will then um, you know, uh, contribute to the improved uh, performance in different mechanisms. So this, uh, as it characterizations, it allows us to study the material uh, at different electrochemical states um, when it's harvested from a cell. Um, as Johanna has highlighted, uh, utilizing the X-ray as tools, we can um, see these materials under operating conditions. In this particular case, we uh, design a uh, pouch cell geometry, which allows us to follow one single uh, lithium copper oxide particle over many cycles. And interestingly, we observe that even for this one single particle, if you operate the cell under different C rate, this particle will respond differently. Now, at the beginning, we were charging in one C, discharging in one C, you see that only 50% of this particle returned to the discharge state after 
in the first cycle. Now, if we do this even faster, in a few minutes charging, a few minutes discharging, you see a smaller percentage of the particle is returned to the discharge state. Even though the entire cell shows that it's at a discharge voltage. Now, if we do this for a longer time, five hours charge, five hours discharge, then you see a significant portion of the particle can be recovered. And of course, if you do the long-term cycling, even under the same condition, there will be some um, degradation over time. So that shows that uh, um, you know, the, there are um, so much complexity already from the single primary grain level to single particle level. And that um, uh, understanding is very useful for us to uh, um, design the materials for better uh, performing battery. Now, the degradation of the uh, battery materials not only happens uh, as we electrochemically cycle the cell. Uh, here, I show you another example in which we first conduct uh, about 20 cycles of the cell, and then we just store the cell under low temperature, doing nothing under low temperature, uh, except for just exposing to the uh, low temperature conditions. And after that, we recover the cell back to room temperature for further electrochemical cycle. And as you can see from this uh, prop here, the low temperature storage actually induces some irreversible degradation, where it's not very obvious at the very beginning, uh, soon after you recover to low, low temperature, but as you cycle from uh, tens to hundreds of cycles, you can see this uh, degradation effect already. And then what happened, right? So we can conduct um, imaging of this uh, uh, material um, from the electro level to the particle level under low temperature. And what we observe is that there's a irre irreversible structural degradation. You can see there's more crack formed under low temperature. And the formation of a crack is not gonna be here when you recover to the room temperature. That's why it reduces the fast charging uh, performance for the following cycles. Now, if we further zoom out, you know, we have showed, I've shown you so many examples at a single particle level, but if you further zoom out, you realize that these particles, they, as I said, they agglomerate together and they are embedded in this porous carbon binder matrix. And collectively, you know, this whole porous system actually delivers the desired functionality. Now, if you are uh, able to conduct high resolution imaging of a um, relatively large uh, volume of the electrode, you will realize that the degradation pattern is highly complicated. For example, in this particular uh, experimental result, we found out that these two cluster of particles, they are only about 100 microns apart, but the degree of damage is very different. And what's causing that? And what's the consequence of this phenomenon? And that's, that's the questions that my group and my colleagues have been asking ourselves and have been making efforts to address. Now, we can, you know, uh, we, we have the capability of conducting this uh, experiment and uh, getting the data, but how do we analyze the data in a statistically, statistically uh, meaningful fashion, you know, with good efficiency? That's a challenge. So, um, so we have been looking into the um, development of machine learning algorithms to help us to do this, to achieve this goal. I'm showing you here one example, right? So this is a one uh, two dimensional slice through a 3D volume we um, imaged. Now we do have good image contrast in this particular case, but the problem is that the, the segmentation, the identification of different particles inside this image is not trivial. For example, if I simply utilize a conventional um, methods for image segmentation, I will very likely identify these small fragments as individual particles. Now, if I take this data as input for my statistical analysis, I will end up with some impression that there are many small particles and these particles have different very weird shape, right? And now, now this is not true because uh, you know, with our eyes plus our brain, we know that these smaller pieces, they belong to the same particle. And we know that a, uh, properly conducted uh, segmentation should result in something like that on the right hand side. So we uh, we would like to do this um, for many many images of this, and we would like to do this uh, automatically. And we don't want to um, uh, have too much of uh, human labor in this process. 
Now, the, um, in order to do this, that reminds me, it, it conceptually is similar to the face recognition program that every cell phone has nowadays. So I did a little bit experiment. This is a screenshot, a screen recording from my cell phone. Okay, I was trying to take a group photo of this um, brilliant people, okay? And you see that my cell phone is trying to be smart. It's identifying the face in the field of view and put a uh, yellow box on the face that is uh, recognized. Now, you can see that it's never perfect. It never identify all the faces in the image. And to me, you know, it never recognized Albert Einstein sitting in the very center of the group. I think that's unacceptable. Now, we would like to do better than this. And how do we do that, right? And I think, um, you know, here I'm just showing you this one very simple but yet very effective approach. Now, the difference we have here is that we have a three-dimensional data. And what we can do is we can take the 2D slice of the three-dimensional data in different orientation, different depths, right? And then once the slice is extracted, we can apply the traditional method utilizing the previous, our group previously developed a machine learning method for the 2D particle identification. And the previous developed uh, machine learning method is already a big step, but it will have errors here and there. It might miss a certain particle in a certain orientation. It might miss the same particle in a certain depth. Okay, but because of the fact that we have a three-dimensional data and by adding this data fusion step, it dramatically improves the uh, fidelity of the identification process. So in our case, there are many, many particles, thousands of particles, and this development allowed us to very efficiently and automatically and accurately determine every single particle in the image volume. And that data set serve as a good input for the follow-up analysis, which I illustrate here schematically. So what we do is we take the data, identify particles, and for every single particle, we extract the structural and chemical and uh, uh, you know, um, different characteristics of the single particles. Now take this data as input, we build another model to, to uh, conduct a prediction of the uh, uh, electro damage. And the question we were asking is that, what is the uh, critical characteristics that will determine the final damage degree of the corresponding particle? And the fact that we were able to harvest thousands of particles provide sufficient amount of input data for us to uh, conduct this uh, uh, statistical analysis with machine learning. So long story short, what we conclude in the end is that in the early stage, you see here, I'm comparing the two cycle uh, electro and uh, another 50 cycle electro. And the horizontal axis is the uh, uh, different characteristics of the uh, particles and uh, the electrodes. And the vertical axis is their contribution score to the final degree of damage. Now, this comparison shows that in the early, uh, early cycles, the uh, features on the left play a more significant role. For the later cycles, the features on the right actually becomes more significant. Now, if you read this text here on a, a horizontal axis with uh, more, more details, you realize that this is a very interesting pattern. The features on the left is more relevant to individual particles characteristics. On the other hand, the feature on the right is more relevant to the particle to particle interaction. So that's why we, th we think this reveals this individualism was the teamwork. You know, in the early cycles, maybe you know, uh, the individual particles, they behave very differently because of, just because they, they are different from the very beginning. But in the later cycles, in order to really make it last for longer cycles, make it you know, uh, prolong the cycle life, we really need to look into how to put these particles together. Okay, so um, let me further zoom out. Now we talk about the electro. Now, what do we see when we further zoom out? We see the cells, right? And the cells, there are many different uh, uh, form factors. People are making the cells for different applications. Um, for example, in this particular case, we were studying a, um, a commercial cell. This is a, um, a cylindrical cell that failed the uh, quality inspection because of the self-discharging effect. So the, the question we were ask, asking is that uh, what was wrong, right? What's happening inside? And 
if you take a um, low resolution, but you know, covering the entire cell uh, uh, tomography of this cylindrical cell, you realize that you know, it doesn't look bad. It, it's, it's actually pretty uh, decently structured. It has all the structure that's anticipated in the system. Now, the key is to look a little bit more into the details and look at the different locations. So for example, if we uh, carefully investigate these uh, um, you know, current collectors near the positive terminal, we see the deformation of the current collectors. And if we go through this um, uh, electro um, uh, uh, size at different depths, you can then uh, identify, for example, there's delamination, there are voids, cracks, here and there. And in addition to that, we also see these uh, impurity particles inside this uh, cylindrical cell. For example, you see these uh, white uh, bright spots here, indicating that the layer, uh, there could be some um, impurity particles inside. Now, having this 3D uh, data reconstructed allowed us to identify the exact location when we unroll the jelly roll structure. And once we do that, then we can harvest the electro uh, corresponding location for further analysis. So what we did is that we cut this small piece out and we conduct a number of different uh, uh, follow-up characterization. For example, we can conduct fluorescence mapping over this uh, particle of interest. And what we see is that uh, these different impurity particles, they actually have different composition. For example, many of them has uh, chromium and iron that could come from the uh, stainless steel, so uh, which may uh, coming from the machine operation. And some of the particles actually has zirconia in it and hafonia in it. So these particles could very well come from the ball mating process. So knowing this uh, composition of these impurity particles will provide useful uh, information for us to go back to the manufacturing pipeline to identify the problem. In addition, we can conduct spectroscopy measurement over this region of interest. So for example, we can conduct the uh, soft X-ray uh, spectroscopy in different modalities and using hard X-rays as well to achieve different probing depths. So it shows that uh, the existence of these impurity particles could uh, further induce surface reconstruction and it could also affect the uh, uh, subsurface and, and the uh, uh, bulk redox reactions inside this electrode. Now, this is, um, you know, cylindrical cell. It's actually a uh, very um, important and broadly utilized uh, uh, form of the uh, battery electrode. But if we look into the other cell formats, for example, looking at the uh, pouch cell format, the uh, conventional tomography method um, uh, actually faces a lot of problem here because just because of the shape of the cell so that you cannot really rotate um, the entire cell for the three dimension. So what we did recently is that we developed a uh, laminography approach, which um, you know, uh, shows uh, the uh, experimental geometry in here. I won't go into the details, but what I want to highlight here is that using this method, we can actually not only see the cathode with good uh, resolution and good fidelity, but also see the graphite anodes um, with good contrast, actually. And this is done in situ, so we can uh, monitor the uh, evolution of the cathode and the, uh, and the anode as we operate the cell under different conditions. So for example, in this case, I'm showing you here that uh, uh, as we charge the, uh, the, the cell, we can see that there are some hot spots developed inside of cathode particle. So that shows the uh, uh, you know, intra-particle heterogeneity. On the other hand, for the image on the bottom here, you can see that there are two small particles on the left. The intensity is more or less the same, but on the, on the right hand side, you see one becomes brighter than the other. So that shows this uh, intraparticle, uh, interparticle heterogeneity, both of which can be induced as we uh, cycle the cell or we abuse the cell electrochemically. The same thing can be done to the uh, anode side, uh, the graphite anode, as I show you in this. Uh, image here, um, there are uh, void formed upon charging, you know, the cracks can be formed in certain particles, uh, anode particles, and we can also observe some of the debonding, you know, cracking at the electro level as well. And more interestingly, we also observed lithium plating 
uh, in this um, uh, in this cell. So what we did is that uh, um, you know because of the fact that we have the 3D data of this pouch cell, so we can select the same depths. So this is a slice near the uh, anode and the separator. We can see that the, at the beginning is very clean. There's no um, structure whatsoever. But as we overcharge the cell, you start to see this uh, uh, interesting feature that's developed. And we um, associate this uh, observation of this feature uh, with lithium plating because we can disassemble the cell. And again, we can visually inspect the uh, location. So which confirms that uh, this is uh, indeed the uh, lithium features. So it actually was a little bit surprising to me because uh, originally uh, everybody was thinking that this low concentration, you know, low Z element is uh, very transparent to the hard ice rays. But uh, we are showing here that uh, with the proper uh, experimental configuration, this can also be observed. So that really opens up a lot of opportunity for us to study this complicated degradation of lithium ion battery under operating conditions. And quite like here, that uh, there are many different degradation mechanisms. And the fact that we are able to visualize different components in the system really um, offers um, uh, opportunity for a uh, in-depth study in this field. So I talk about the uh, complexity of the uh, battery from the uh, single uh, prim primary grain to the secondary particles, to the actual, to the cell, you know, to big cells. Eventually, the battery cells has to be integrated into a you know, system to power some device. So this is a very recent study that we were doing. It's very interesting. I have this uh, wireless earbuds and it's abused by my son. <laughs> it's not working anymore. That's why we decided to, uh, to uh, put it into the S-ray and take a look uh, what's happening inside. It's very interesting that, uh, you know, in addition to observing the um, you know, damage inside a, a cylindrical cell, we can also review the structural defects at the device level, how, how the cell is connected, how it's integrated into the system, how it uh, interface with the, you know, uh, for example, battery management unit. You know, all of this you know, becomes more um, industry relevant and um, you know, um, uh, the existing tools actually provides good uh, opportunity for research in this direction, but in my opinion, a significant uh, improvement in the throughput is still desired. That's why my group is also looking into the methodology developments to improve the uh, uh, efficiency, and hopefully we will provide a better solution for the future uh, efforts in this field. So finally, let me conclude. Um, I. Uh, so I talk about the uh, multi-scale structural and chemical complexity in the lithium-ion battery. I also want to highlight that uh, the manufacturing of the lithium-ion battery actually has many, many different uh, steps in it, and they are uh, delicate. Many things can go wrong. And utilizing the uh, S-ray tools with different modality covering different land scales can offer opportunity for us to not just to get the uh, uh, fundamental insights, but also to conduct the failure analysis, to uh, get the uh, uh, valuable information to inform the production process. And with that, I would like to thank my uh, collab collaborators uh, in all these works. Uh, as I show in this uh, slide here, we work with material scientists who create the materials and we utilize a suite of uh, X-ray techniques, not just the synchrotron, but also the uh, laboratory uh, X-ray tools. And we conduct, um, uh, you know, uh, computational developments to help us to make sense of the data. And we work with theorists to understand the uh, insight and to uh, provide feedbacks to guide the next generation, uh, next iteration. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Eugene, for that beautiful talk, linking all the different length scales, um, largely using one technique. I think this really speaks to the power of the approach. Um, so we have a number of questions here, and maybe we can start with a high level one. Mm -hmm. um, so Eugene, you showed a lot of beautiful images and, and tomograms. Um, can you comment a little bit on how it is connected to the macroscopic behavior of the battery in terms of the electrochemical measurements. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Are you able to correlate the two? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, uh, uh, let, that's a very good question. Thank you, Will. 
And there are two things I want to uh, highlight. For example, um, when we are working on high resolution imaging, looking at single particles, we often uh, you know, design special cells. You know, um, for example, the capillary cell, where it seems, you know, some people even do single particle cell, you know. Uh, so, so for that, you know, on the one hand, the electrochemical data is directly relevant to the particle you're observing, right? But on the other hand, uh, the electrochemical data is not the real cell electrochemical data. So, so there's a trade-off over there. But on the other hand, for the large scale, you know, uh, industry relevant, or maybe even commercial cells, I think the statistics is really a key. So in addition to just uh, imaging one cell or maybe a few cells, I think uh, the uh, uh, high throughput characterization of many, many cells and link this to layer electrochemical data in a statistically relevant fashion, I think that would be the um, right thing to do. And I believe that a lot of industry is doing this and uh, our uh, expertise can apply. And also I would say that uh, as I highlighted at the end of my talk, um, methodology development for even high, higher throughput to conduct a structural measurement will be uh, key to really address this. Great, Yijing. Uh, there's also now uh, just another question on imaging even lighter and dilute um, species, uh, specifically the electrolyte. Uh, can you comment on some of the uh, opportunities for imaging electrolyte, salt depletion, uh, mm -hmm. wetting, non-wetting, and so forth um, mm -hmm. using X-ray tomography? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there are uh, challenges in general uh, when, when you are talking about like a dilute uh, species and also low co concentration and also um, you know, low Z in general uh, using X-rays. Uh, I think this is a common sense, but uh, as I show in, in this um, a recent development, it actually surprised me that uh, utilizing a laminography approach can actually show you the lithium plating inside. And uh, with fairly good resolution, you know, it is one micron resolution. So, so I, I see the opportunity over there. On the other hand, I also want to highlight that, uh, for example, if you have some uh, electrolyte additives uh, in the cell, uh, potentially you can also image the bulk of the material as an indirect, um, measurement of the consequences of the uh, uh, presence of the uh, additives. For example, uh, we have a very recent uh, uh, paper in Nature uh, Energy together with uh, the group from um, uh, Bookhaven um, studying this uh, uh, you know, uh, electro additives. And at the very beginning, we were utilizing soft X-ray tools to uh, really focus on the surface chemistry. But then we started to brainstorm. I, I was asking, you know, in the end, the lithium has to intercalate into the bulk, right? It's the bulk that store the energy. So when we tune the surface chemistry, in the end, it should reflect into the bulk heterogeneity as well. So, so uh, with that said, then we conduct again the similar approach, uh, you know, chemical imaging, you know, with uh, machine learning statistics. We realize that indeed a little bit of the surface chemistry uh, modulation can actually affect what's happening in the bulk. So you are not directly measuring what's happening on the surface using hot X-ray tools, but it will help you to understand the, uh, you know, um, the consequences uh, as a whole. Great, thank you so much, Yijing. And then maybe we can take one final question before uh, inviting Johanna back um, to the panel discussion. So uh, in, in several of the papers you mentioned, um, you're identifying these very small changes in the composition or microstructure mm -hmm. of cathode active materials. Mm -hmm. um, so have you been able to derive um, some unifying um, rules about how to design the microstructure of these cathodes based on your understanding of the degradation pathways? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that, that, that's a, a very good uh, um, uh, comment. So, so one thing that we, uh, you know, proposed in a recent science paper is that uh, we observe the, um, you know, a polarization effect, uh, which is kind of uh, unavoid unavoidable, <laughs> in particular, if we are going to uh, seek electrodes. And we propose that, uh, uh, you know, by doing this uh, uh, structural engineering at the actual level, for example, we can tune the uh, uh, packing density as a function of the depths, then, uh, you know, it, it could potentially uh, mitigate some of this uh, polarization effect. But uh, in the lateral um, direction, uh, we think that uh, 
uh, is it, not just to make the uh, individual particles better, but to make the uh, consistency of different particles so that everybody will work together, right? It's a very interesting, um, uh, you know, a comment made by my colleague, uh, Ke Jie from uh, Purdue University. He said, it's very similar to managing a big group of researchers, right? You have uh, 20 students, five of them are super good. So what do you do, right? You can use them, you can, you know, let them work very hard uh, at the beginning, then they get tired out. Then you start to look into the second tier. So this is one scenario. The other scenario is that if you engineer the system such that um, these individual particles, um, you know, this group, they more work together as a whole, as a team, then maybe you reach to a equilibrium uh, at that stage, all the particles are still in good shape. So, you know, so, so it's not just a, a, a making the materials, but also to put the materials together in a, a coherent fashion. I think that's a there's a broader comment to be made about things in life in general. I think. <laughs> um, awesome. Thank you so much, Yijing, again, for the wonderful talk and the beautiful images. So I think we have a, a, just a little bit uh, uh, under 30 minutes for a discussion with the, the both of you. So if I can ask Johanna also to rejoin. Welcome back, Johanna. So, you know, in this part of our seminar, we sort of go all over the place and, and discuss things um, a little bit more broadly. So I thought I would maybe start the discussion by asking the following question. I think this may be the questions on a lot of people's mind. So um, the seminar is attended uh, considerably by those working in industry. And in industry, um, iteration time is very important. Um, people are trying to you know, design their next best batteries uh, tomorrow. And you both show these very extensive and in-depth studies of materials that took you know, many months to measure and sometimes years to fully interpret. So there is a little bit of disconnect, right? So this is basic research and method development using very advanced and not widespread available tools. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are today. I believe you've made the case very clearly that this can really advance battery engineering and development, both of you. But how do we make these tools to really work on the time scale of industry as people are trying to you know, really go through thousands or tens of thousands of iterations to get a better battery? Maybe I can ask Johanna to, to weigh in on this. I think this is um, kind of the, the crucial question on my mind. Um, yeah, well, I would almost say that's the wrong question to ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'll explain myself. Um, so I think you're right, these tools are very advanced and they take a long time to um, both get to the data and analyze the data. And, and we've, we are working on speeding those sort of things up, um, but the accessibility of the instruments is an issue. And so I think there's, there's two things that we can do with a synchrotron. The first is to really um, use the synchrotron to to get some fundamental understanding of how these class of materials work. And with that understanding, um, be able to validate models that could perhaps um, expand that into similar, but um, you know, not identical cases, um, either different materials, different chemistries, scaling it up, things like that. Um, and then the second way is um, we can also think about maybe developing um, other in situ monitoring techniques, um, and I'm sort of haven't really thought about this in detail yet. Um, where um, maybe um, we can get an understanding of um, of signatures. For example, um, there's been some work in in using um, um, sound sound waves to to probe batteries and 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 understand degradation that's happening in a battery. Um, but it's really hard to interpret the data. Um, so we could do X-ray imaging or um, other characterization with X-rays at a synchrotron simultaneous to a probe that would be more accessible um, to industry, maybe even accessible to monitoring um, electrodes as you are making them or cycling batteries um, at a larger scale. So I think those two connections, connecting to um, the fundamental research to sort of um, broader um, 
scale up issues with modeling and also then um, monitoring techniques and understanding the, the signatures from different monitoring techniques that could be used um, at the industrial level. Yijing? Yes, yes. So um, I agree with everything Johanna said. Uh, now, uh, maybe let, in my perspective, it's useful to look back in the history um, of asteroids. Now, before synchrotron even exists, all these X-ray categorization tools was available in the laboratory. Right? People were doing this in the laboratory. Right? It's broadly available. You know, if you have a decent budget, you can buy some tools for your lab to conduct some studies. But then we have the synchrotron development, which shows you know, great improvement in the uh, throughput because of flux and all that. So people start to you know, uh, come back and, and come to utilize synchrotron as a, um, you know, let, let's say, uh, advanced tools. But after so many years, with all the developments in different technology, in X-ray source, in X-ray detector, in X-ray um, you know, optics and all that, now we are actually seeing a trend that we can bring some of these uh, capabilities back into a lab. You know, it doesn't have to be as bright as a synchrotron, which is a billion dollars too much. But uh, you know, if you say, you know, um, one order of magnitude lower, or maybe a little bit more than that lower, you know, it becomes start to become available. And for this, you know, the um, uh, industry application the availability and the uh, you know, accessibility is so important. So I think at this point, um, it was to look into some um, you know, um, effort to really make it a uh, you know, standalone technique as well. So I think uh, there are a lot of efforts in this field already, and uh, I'm also looking into this uh, in the future. So Eugene, John, if I merge your thoughts, I think what you're saying here is, yes, it will be, the throughput for these advanced measurement is indeed much slower than other lower fidelity measurement like lab tomography and X-ray imaging, um, but the insight is much greater. So if you can somehow transfer the insight backward, um, that would be very helpful. But I think Eugene, you're also saying that uh, there may be opportunities in the coming years or decades to bridge the gap a little bit more, maybe bring more intense X-rays to the laboratory setting. Certainly that has already happened, uh, just not as far. So it sounds like there's a both way traffic going. going. And, and are you both envisioning a future where, you know, these synchrotron X-ray imaging and laboratory X-ray imaging will all be sort of together in a very giant iteration loop and then just sort of a down selection process of, you know, picking the most important samples uh, that would deliver the most insights and then put that in front of a synchrotron X-ray. I think, for, yeah, for the public science side of things, yes. Um, I would also um, say that we should, as a battery community, think about um, how um, the pharmaceutical company uses the synchrotron. And so the pharmaceutical companies um, use synchrotrons all of the time. Um, they do proprietary research. They actually use the same beamline as their competitors, um, and they have really solved the accessibility issue um, by simplifying the, the, the data that they want and, um, and making a pipeline. Johanna, maybe you can speak a little bit more to this pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I think many of our listeners are from industry. Um, can you briefly describe uh, how companies might be able to uh, employ these resources for their internal R&D efforts and maybe highlight a collaborations or two? Um, uh, in which this has happened. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's at its infancy in the in the battery field for sure. Um, but so let me first explain what how um, protein crystallography um, works with um, the pharmaceutical company. And so there they have essentially simplified the the synchrotron question that they're asking. And so they want the crystal structure, the, the protein structure of whatever drug they're creating. Um, and they have used computers to automatically look at the data as it's coming in, reject anything that isn't of high enough quality. Um, and the scientists from the, the pharmaceutical companies don't even need to, to really know much about analyzing the data because it's all been automated. Um, so I think that's the extreme case that we could maybe aim for. Um, I would maybe argue also that 
Maybe our problems are a little more complicated than just knowing where atoms are located with relative to each other. Um, but I think we can take um, a lot of those lessons um, for eliminating the red tape or, or creating um, a very smooth path for industry to, 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 to make these partnerships happen um, with staff scientists um, doing proprietary research. And also, um, I think we um, have learned a lot from the past two years of, of operating synchrotron during a pandemic, which has made us leverage remote access far more than we ever were comfortable before. It has um, allowed us to do to, to think about problems of you know automatic um, data transfer, um, trying to to um, collect data remotely, um, automatic sample changing. We now have robots on many of our diffraction beam lines to to swap out samples, um, and so. We're working towards that, and I think um, it's it'll work in many different cases. But there will always be opportunities for these these harder experiments, whether the in situ or or the uh, multi scale um, degradation um, problems. So I think it's a combination of both. Um, so you you asked for an example of companies. Um, so I've actually worked with um, a few different companies, both you know, larger scale, like um, we, we had a collaboration with Bosch, for example, and also startups where um, it was more um, trying to get um, DOE funding like be through an SBIR or something like that, um, small business grant. Um, so we work on both levels um, because Eugene and I are you know, scientists by trade. Um, we, we, we get fed by, by publications. So um, there's less of an incentive for us to do non, uh, to, for us to do proprietary work, but there are mechanisms at the synchrotron that allow that to happen. And I would say that synchrotron, the cost of using a synchrotron is very cheap um, because you're not paying for human labor. Um, you're just paying for instrument time. And, and so compared to other things, um, it's not an expensive mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, so uh, maybe I can add that uh, um, uh, to really facilitate uh, collaboration between uh, large facility and the uh, industry. I think uh, for the industry, it would be beneficial if they um, have a clear definition of the question that they are asking. Uh, so, so for example, some of the uh, um, questions, more engineering questions, may maybe you really need to have a lot of uh, no, not just measure one sample, 10 sample, maybe you need to measure 100 samples to really get an idea you know, with statistics. Then that kind of um, question, you know, you need to consider. It may, it may not be a good question to ask from uh, you know, single uh, you know, uh, experiments. On the other hand, if you have a, uh, you know, uh, a very difficult but very important cutting edge you know, material uh, problem, then Maybe you don't have a choice. You have to use synchrotron. <laughs> so, so I guess uh, um, you know, de depending on the need, then we can um, you know, work out different uh, arrangements uh, for, for collaborations. And, and I, I will also say that uh, you know we we mostly utilize synchrotron, but we also utilizing the laboratory systems and you know um, to study the industry relevant uh, samples like cells and commercial cells, the cylindrical polycells cells and large cells. We we also have. Um, let's say expertise to offer in that domain as well. It's just a, you know, a different domain. Um, and um, uh, I think uh, uh, the national level generally encourage this and uh, we can work together to explore. Yeah, I think both of you made it very clear today. It's um, getting the result, the data is just half of the problem and then interpreting, analyzing and interpreting it is actually could be even more challenging. So I think it highlights the need um, uh, for both. So, um, China, so maybe coming back a little bit to the science and the engineering side of things, both of you talked about sort of two extreme of microstructure, right? Um, one extreme is when the microstructure changes very large, right? Um, like the, the, the tin alloy um, electra that Johanna showed. And then in the other extreme, I think Eugene, you're talking about a, a tiny crack that happens. Um, so there's both these small microstructure change and big microstructure change in the battery. Can you talk a little bit about sort of what you think the future is in terms of microstructure engineering 
um, you know, there is now this increased um, notion that we need to go to these very microstructure changing materials like conversion electrodes to get the high energy density. But there's also this feeling that, well, these small microstructure changes really what kills you at the end. Um, so maybe we can, you know, zoom out from the methodology itself, but to the, to the sort of the science and engineering of how do we manage microstructure going forward, right? So that the, 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 the limit of no microstructure change is, is long gone, right? Uh, we don't do that anymore. Um, you know, that doesn't give you the type of energy density needed for, for battery technologies. So I think this is something that's being very sort of on the top of my mind as well, as we think about, you know, how do we manage microstructure? Just like how aging how do we manage people? <laughs> do you want to go first? Or you want me to go first? No, you can go first. Okay. Um, so I, I think it goes uh, at least um, for the alloying anodes. Um, what we've found is um, so so the manode porosity is is somewhat like you're saying is is a little bit of of trying to prevent the microstructural change or maybe just make minimize it. Um, but I think what we've also found is that um, many of these alloys um, go through either crystalline structural changes or amorphous crystalline changes. And so we've found that um, I think there was there was one anode um, that we looked at that went through crystalline structure change if we lithiated it. But if we sodiated it, it was all amorphous and then ended crystalline. And allowing the um, anode to go through an amorphous change healed the cracks that we um, created early on. And so this was um, allowed us to sort of manage the large morphology changes because we healed the cracks as we formed them um, because, because it, was, it was no longer just crystalline um, phase changes. And I think the, the other thing to think about is whenever we're managing these, these microstructural changes is you know, if, are we developing systems that are scalable? Um, you know, if we create this, um, this perfect anode that can cycle for thousands of cycles, but you can only develop it in a small beaker and you'll never be able to scale it to, to something that's industry relevant, then, then I think it's a scientifically interesting finding, but it's not necessarily going to, to develop um, the battery um, community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, um... A lot of this study uh, provides insight into the uh, you know, magnetic insights, and that you know we how do I say it? so so we take this magnetic insights in a way that uh, you know it's not just a literal you know finding you know it's just just not just by itself but we need to extrapolate it a little bit right so for example um, when we talk about the polarization effect then we See, okay, maybe the gradient will be a viable approach. And then, how do we achieve a gradient? We can do, uh, you know, somehow field guided or some, for example, the uh, 3D printing, you know, then it becomes like um, open field, right? So, the, the insight we got is the, maybe it's a, a desire for the gradient structure, but how do we achieve it? Then it's open field, everybody can come up with new ideas to achieve that. So, so that's one example, right? And also, for example, the, uh, um, uh, the um, you know, uh, uh, consistency of different particles, right? And we say it's important, but we don't necessarily need to make like perfect spheres, right? Or, or consider perfect sphere. We can have some elongation, for example, if that's um, better for a synthesis perspective. But if we do have the elongation, then you know, uh, do we align them, or you know, uh, in a, a um, you know, electro structuring um, efforts, or do we prefer not to have them aligned? Do we prefer random orientation? So the magnetic study can help us to get that information to figure out what's desirable, and then you know, and more engineering effort can be proposed to achieve it. Hmm. Yijing, thank you so much for that. Um, maybe building off what you said, and I, I think when, when we report um, energy density in academia, we often say, you know, per kilogram, right, graphometric. 
But often in industry, um, the interest is more on the volume metric side, especially for electric vehicles to keep the battery small. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I if you look at some of these problems that you have reported on today, you know, decreasing the volume metric density is a good way to solve the problem. Maybe by adding more um, carbon network or by providing more space for the particles to expand and shrink. What do you think about this sort of what seems to be a fundamental um, trade-off between graphometric and volumetric energy density when it comes to a sort of volume changing material? Is there any way to break that relationship? Um, so, you know, you know, how can we pack the electrodes much more closely, but still allowing it to last many thousands of cycles? That's very difficult. <laughs> Um, I don't have a good idea for that, uh, but I mean, to me, I agree with you. It's, this seems to me is like a fundamental conflict we are trying to resolve. You know, um, you know, I can make a ping pong ball so robust, it bounces around, it doesn't crack. <laughs> but you know, the density is so low, it's not going to be useful mm-hmm. for for the uh, you know uh, as the electro. But I guess uh, after all, it's a uh, application driven design. I guess uh, it's, it's better to uh, start from the end application and then define the need and you know define you know what the volumetric density is desirable and all that and then work from there backward to uh, conduct the uh, uh, material design. I think that would be the rational approach. Johanna? Yeah, and I um, agree with what Eugene said, and I think designing electrodes, not just designing the materials to high, have high capacity, both gravimetric and volumetric, but designing the electrodes as well. Um, and that's some problem that we we found in you know, in the fast charging world is is you can design a battery that fast charges. That's not the problem, but can you design a battery that's high capacity that fast charges? Um, and so I'm. You know, I'm less worried about, and maybe I should be, I'm, I'm less worried about capacity, gravimetric and, and volumetric, um, because I feel like I, I feel like the battery industry has done that. Like we we have really great electric vehicles. <laughs> um, and I'm more worried about looking into the future and 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 looking at do we have the material resources to 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 meet this demand that we've created because we've made electric vehicles so desirable and we've 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 sold the idea that we're going to electrify everything and everything's going to have a battery um can we actually do that with lithium can we do that with nmc um you know so so i think at least for my interests going towards those those novel electrode materials that meet what we have gravimetric and 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 volumetric right now but with lower cost um, more sustainable materials. So I think that that's at least my interest in, in where the community is going. Sounds like an awesome vision, uh, Johanna. Thank you for that. Um, as we're coming to the end of the hour, you know, I thought I would ask more of a forward-looking question. So I, I find it's very useful to look backward. Um, so you know, if you take yourself back to you know 2005, 2010, um, I don't know what you thought, but I you know. If I would say, well, in 2022, what will we achieve? Um, my guess is that many of the things you presented today, it's like, oh, that's probably going to be very, very hard to do all of this stuff, to see lithium, to see carbon, you know, to see 3D microstructures, intensive nanometer level, to do batteries, you know, cycling operando. Um, well, I don't know. Maybe you're optimist that so you thought that was very easy, but I certainly thought it was very challenging. So I would like to ask you to sort of think ahead for another 10 years. Uh, where do you think we will be at in terms of advanced material analytics, uh, in terms of characterization? What do you think we can do 10 years from now that we won't be able to do today? Um, as a sort of forward-looking, sort of set the goalposts for, for the community. I'll, let you, I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Yeah, yeah. I think one challenge that we have yet to to tackle, and we've been, I would say, we've been wanting to tackle it sort of from day one, is um, the the true combination of of techniques. Um, And so one technique will never answer all of your questions. Um, And and right now we often take 
um, one sample and go to different um, instruments and, and or even similar samples and look at them in, in, a, in an array of instruments. Um, but the ultimate goal would be to, to take all of those instruments and put them into one, one mega instrument and be able to characterize your battery while it's operating um, across many different probes um, and, and really get a, a fundamental understanding across length scales um, on the same battery um, and really make those connections. And maybe that's a complete pipe dream, but I think as a, as a, as a characterization person, that, that's the future that I get excited about. Well, this video is recorded, so we can always uh, play it back 10 years from now to see if this is realized. But that sounds, sounds awesome. Well, Thank Eugene you. likes to give pictures of me 10 years ago, so I expect <laughs> that. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, what I want to do in the next 10 years is to um, bring all these uh, uh, techniques we talk about today. You know, it's so cutting edge, so fancy, so high resolution. I want to bring it available so that we can plug it into the uh, manufacturing, you know, uh, lines, you know, so that you it will pro uh, provide sufficient uh, throughput efficiency and sufficient degree of automation, so that it will be really utilized in the industry instead of just utilized at a single job. So that's that's my um, my dream, and uh, how am I going to do that? I don't know, <laughs> but but uh, I think uh, efforts are needed to push this direction. Well, we have both of you on record stating <laughs> these really, I think, really bold goals. But you know, like I said, you know, twelve years ago, two thousand ten, you probably, yeah, would have thought today is not quite possible. But yet here we are. Um, I think on a brighter note, I mean, there are a huge amount of resources being invested. There's a huge amount of interest. Uh, and this is a critical link to the energy transition, and not just for batteries, but for other um, material-driven technology as well. So uh, I'm very hopeful that um, we can make that happen, um, along with the other, um, the, the entire community working on this. So thank you both um, very much for sharing that bold vision. Um, I really look forward to talking to you in 10 years, uh, or and also between then as well. Um, <laughs> So with that, uh, let me join our audience and thank you both again for taking the morning to talk. So, so number of exciting things happening uh, in the coming weeks uh, here at Stanford. Um, so we will have our first um, big in-person seminar. So for those of you um, tuning in from the Bay Area, um, we will be hosting uh, Professor Martin Winter from the University of Münster. So he directs the Meet uh, Battery Center, one of the largest uh, academic industrial uh, complex uh, in Europe. And uh, he will be joining us uh, next Tuesday um, here at Stanford. So if you're interested uh, in attending, please uh, register now. Uh, the spots are very limited. And it's a, one of the great opportunity to meet um, um, our European colleagues here uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, and then uh, following that, uh, we will have another exciting uh, storage X seminar. Uh, in, uh, this is next week, so our schedule is a little bit um, um, out of uh, sequence. So on May 27th, so one, Friday, one week from today, uh, we will have a discussion on what is a very interesting concept of cell to pack. Um, and Professor Chaoyang Wang and uh, Mujib uh, Ijaz, uh, CEO of Next Energy, our next energy will be discussing um, batteries at the link scale between cells and packs. And this is a, a very interesting technology to increase um, the performance of batteries, not at the materials level nor the cell level, but at the pack level. Uh, so this will be a very interesting uh, length bridging discussion. Uh, and then two weeks after that, on June 10th, uh, we are very pleased um, to feature uh, Kevin Wujek, uh, who is the Chief Technical Officer at Blue Current. Uh, they are a, a very promising solid state battery startup here in the area uh, with uh, strong connections to Stanford um, to talk about uh, their latest um, polymer based solid state batteries. And then he will be joined by my colleague, uh, Professor Alberto Saleo, who will also talk about next generation recyclable batteries uh, uh, based on polymers and organic molecules. Uh, and just to remind everyone, um, please connect with us on social media. Uh, we announce a lot of our uh, events 
uh, on LinkedIn. Um, there are going to be more and more and more thanks um, to the easing COVID situations. And we really look forward in, in sending uh, many of you. Uh, and then for those of you very inter uh, interested in education, um, Stanford also has a professional education program. Um, so uh, take a look at this link. Uh, there are multiple courses we're offering, including a recently launched one on electric vehicles and electric grid. Um, being, being taught by um, uh, experts um, uh, from Stanford and my colleagues. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone once again for joining us um, today, uh, morning here at Stanford. And I hope all of you have a great weekend. Thank you, everyone.